Good morning. After that song, we may as well just have the benediction and go home. Thank you, Marsha. That was beautiful. Good message. The title this morning is He Came for You. How many of you can think of a Bible text that says exactly that, whether it's paraphrased or not, that Jesus came to die on the cross just for you? Anybody? John 3.16. John 3.16. Are there any other? By the way, can you quote John 3.16? That whosoever, what? Everlasting life. The reward of accepting Jesus' life for us. Anyone else? Let's try it. And what is it? Amen. Anyone else? These are texts that are written down on a list and they're on my desk at home. That's why I ask for help. <clears throat> and I know that's cheating a little bit, but I wanted to, it to share you to share your knowledge with your friends and neighbors. I want to tell you a little story. And we had a good, didn't we have a good children's story? And did you notice the size of the children? We have been feeding them well. <laughs> and I'm glad that they all participated. A young couple moved into a new house in a new town. And that happened to us just a while back, depending on your evaluation of what's recent. This story did not happen to us. The wife and the husband are sitting in their dining room and they have windows that look over into their neighbor's yard and the wife turns to the husband and says, can you imagine her doing that? Or doing what? She's hold, hanging her laundry out with clothespins on a clothesline. Some of us have done that in the ancient past. Since we have clothes dryers, we don't get to see the neighbor's laundry, dirty or clean, for which we're thankful. She says, that laundry's dirty. Look at that sheet. There's dirt all over it. And the husband agrees with her. Somebody needs to tell her to change her soap. Well, this happened two or three times. And I'm assuming laundry was done back then once a week. One morning they get up and the lady is hanging out her laundry again. And the wife speaks up and says, Look, somebody told her she changed her soap. The laundry is clean. <clears throat> Husband coughed and looked over at her and says, uh, I got up early and washed our windows. <laughs> Sometimes we need to clean our windows so that we can see clearly what is really happening around us. There's an interesting ad that's appeared on TV several times of a lady walking with a purse hanging over her shoulder. Anybody seen the ad? A guy sneaks up behind her, reaches out, and grabs the purse and jerks her backwards. In one viewpoint, he's robbing her. 
But in the next instant, a vehicle goes past where she is about to step out into. Two viewpoints of the same happening. He saved her life in reality. He was a criminal when you first looked at it. What do we really see when we look around us at the things that are happening in the world. Anna spoke about the Conflict of the Ages series this morning, the free books that are available out there. How many of you have this book in your library at home? I see several hands. If you don't have it, it's Desire of Ages, by the way. If you don't have it, pick one up and read it. Half a hundred years ago, it was voted the most authentic book on the life of Christ in the Library of Congress, of which there are hundreds and hundreds of books on the life of Christ there. Your assignment, and we'll pretend you're back in school, is if you haven't read it recently, get it and read the chapter entitled Gethsemane. And remember the title of the sermon. He came for you. For in this chapter, if you can read it and keep your eyes dry, it may mean your heart is a little hard. For this is the king of the universe that it's speaking about, the creator of everything that has ever been created. And his suffering. To give you a little background of this chapter, he had just completed the Lord's Supper. He had just established communion, the order of humility. And he and his disciples went out and went to a place called Gethsemane, where Christ often went to pray. I'm reading from page 687 and onward in that chapter. Christ's soul was filled with dread of separation from God. There's a song written, he could have called 10,000 angels but he died alone for you and me. He didn't have the assurance of the acceptance of his sacrifice. His death was planned before the foundation of the world. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, at that committee meeting so long ago, volunteered to give his life for you and for me. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. As the chairman of the board, using modern language, when Christ volunteered to give his life for you and I, God accepted the volunteer.
I don't think it was ever brought up that he didn't really have to. I don't think God the Father ever said to Jesus Christ, you really don't have to do this. To the great God of heaven, the God of the universe, how hard would it have been for him to snap his fingers and this earth would have disappeared. The people on this earth would have been annihilated, dissolved into non-existence, and Jesus walked down, fly down, however he got here, and say, let there be light again. Well, what would it have cost? With his power, how important are you? With his power, why did he go to all the trouble of becoming a child, being raised in a wicked world, and then going to Gethsemane? Behold him contemplating the price to be paid for the human soul. In his agony, he clings to the cold ground as if to present, prevent himself from being drawn further away from God. The chilling dew of the night falls upon his prostrate form but he heeds it not. From his pale lips comes the bitter cry, Oh, my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Yet even now he adds these words, Nevertheless, not as I will, but thy will be done. I'm reading from the book Desire of Ages. If you would like to go to the scriptures, you can find this story. Four different versions. Matthew 26, verse 36 to 56. In Mark, you can find it. Chapter 14, verse 32 to 50. In Luke, you find it in chapter 22, verse 39 to 53. And in John, chapter 18, verse 1 to 12. If you want to write those down, read them. Along with the chapter, Gethsemane. After this, he came to his disciples with a yearning desire to hear words of comfort from those whom he had so often blessed and comforted. The one who had always had words of sympathy for them was now suffering super, superhuman agony. And he longed to know that they were praying for him and for themselves. How dark the malignity of sin. Terrible was the temptation to let the human race bear the consequences of its own guilt while he stood innocent before God. If he could only know that his disciples understood. Rising with painful effort, he staggered to the place where he had left his companion. And he finds them asleep. They had not he heeded his warning. Watch and pray. Poor self-sufficient Peter. Although all shall be offended, he says, yet will not I. Oh, Peter. Simon, sleepest thou? 
Couldst thou not pray with me one hour? Watch and pray lest ye enter into temptation. The spirit is truly ready and the flesh is weak. He goes back and he falls on his face on the ground. Now he was like a reed beaten and bent by the angry storm. He had approached the consummation of his work, a conqueror having at each step gained the victory over the powers of darkness. As one already glorified, he had claimed oneness with God. In unfaltering accents, he had poured out his songs of praise. He had spoken to his disciples in words of courage and tenderness. Now had come the hour of power of darkness. We've all heard how Jesus went into the wilderness after his baptism and how he met Satan face to face and how he was tempted. Satan realized that this conflict was for the rulership of the world. Lucifer had one chance to make Christ sin. If he could do that, the victory was his and the world was forever his. And it comes down to Gethsemane. Again, he falls on his face, prays the same prayer again. Father, if possible, is there a loophole that we didn't see? Is there a way out for me other than the cross? But nevertheless, not my will, but thine. He comes back and the disciples are sleeping again. Or sleeping yet. And he goes back and an angel from heaven came down to strengthen him. The angel that took Lucifer's place at the side of the throne of God was dispatched not to take the cup away, but to give him encouragement as he could look into the future and see Lebanon, Missouri. And the church today, with you sitting in the pews, and Christ saying, Father, it's a good plan. We can save a representative of the human race. Not my will, but thine be done. Brothers and sisters, he did this for you. He did it for me. There are those now living who have an experience like my own. They have recognized the truth unfolding for this time. They have kept in step with the great leader, captain of the Lord's host in the proclamation of this message. Jesus said, if you remain faithful to the end, you will have a crown of life. You will approach the throne of God in person. 
You will come to me and see the hands that were nailed to the cross for you. Now I want you to think about your life. I want you to think about the mistakes you've made. Anybody here that hasn't made a mistake? Man, I can raise both hands and both feet. No, you don't want to see me raise my feet. We have sinned and come far short of the glory of God. And he made it possible for you and I to enjoy heaven throughout eternity. The disciples who were awakened by the brightness of the angel's presence and the glory of the God of heaven which shone about them. They saw his face marked with bloody sweat of agony and they were filled with fear. By the way, I want to put in a uh, plug for prayer meeting. We were studying Daniel and we heard what could be the first drum roll in recorded history. When Belshazzar's knees smote together as he saw the handwriting on the wall. And he didn't know, but we can look back and imagine that that was the beginning of the song Wipeout. For those of you that aren't drummers, we listened to that as our kids practiced the drums for years. His anguish of mind they could not understand. His visage was so marred more than any man and his form more than the sons of man. And we find that reference in Isaiah 52, 14. I don't know what you want to do. Finally, Jesus looks at the disciples that are sleeping and says, Sleep on. Take your rest. Behold, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hand of sinners. One of his own disciples. is about to betray him with a kiss. Jesus steps forward as the throng comes out and says, Whom seek ye? And someone answers, Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus doesn't say he went that way. He says, I am he. And when he admitted that he was the Son of God, they fell back as dead men. Looking around, Jesus sees the disciples and says again to them, Whom seek ye? Jesus of Nazareth. And you could picture at any other time there might have been some sarcasm in his voice when he said, I just told you I am he. But not this time. I told you that I am he. Take me. But let them go. You have nothing, to, nothing against them. They've just been with me. Let them go. And they took him. They tied his hands. They spat upon him. They beat him. They took him before rulers who could find nothing wrong. 
and yet the crowd cried, crucify him. Because of you. Because of me. Go home and read it. I have another little book here. And I know that some of you don't have it. It's one of the little red books. And it's called Selected Messages, Book Two. John, you're nodding your head, so I know you, <laughs> I know you have it. This is probably one of the most encouraging books that Ellen G. White ever wrote. It was admonitions in select instances for you and I to encourage us how to react to the job that God gave you to do. On page 168, there's a subtitle, Reward of Fidelity. And if you don't have it, I know that there's a copy here in the library that you're more than welcome to, to borrow and read. Or call the Book and Bible House and they'll send you one. And it says this, You will have a great conflict with the power of evil in your own heart. Well, I'm going to stop right there at the end of that sentence and tell you that you need to fall on the ground as Christ did in Gethsemane, praying for deliverance when this happens. You have felt that there was a higher work for you, but oh, if you would only take up the work lying directly in front of you. We all want to do great things. We all want to go to the mission field. Like the mission story this morning, that young couple that went to Spain. But oh, if you would only take up that work lying directly in your path and do it with fidelity, not seeking in any way to exalt self, the peace and joy would come to your soul pure, richer, and more satisfying than the conquerors in earthly warfare. To live and work for God and make the best use we can of all our time and faculties is to grow in grace and in knowledge. This we can do because it is our work. Whose work? Yours! Mine! You must needs put away your questioning doubts and have full faith in the reality of your divine mission. Of the what kind of mission? He's talking to you. He's talking to me with a heavenly, a divine mission. Jesus left heaven to die in our place. And we haven't even told our next door neighbors in many cases what he's done in our life. You know, I've heard people, and John has too, I'm not a preacher. <laughs> oh, yes, you are. You just don't know it. And the only sermon you have the only sermon you have, the only message we can give to a world is what Jesus Christ did in our lives. You don't have to preach the three angels' message. You don't have to preach about the three Hebrew worthies in the fiery furnace or any other of the great stories that are in the Bible. You can only tell what God has done for you. Now, if he hasn't done anything, you're in trouble. You don't have much of a message to give. So get one. Get one. 
How many people did Jesus come to save? Anybody that isn't included in that? And the only thing you can do is accept his gift. What did Jesus say? Turned around and he says, take up your cross and follow me. And the rich young ruler went away sorrowful because he had too much junk. Too much stuff. And brothers and sisters, in 2023, we sure have a lot of stuff. We sure have a lot of stuff. You say, well, I'm poor. I don't have much stuff. Oh, that. Don't try moving. <laughs> don't try moving. I'll tell you. And I didn't think we had a lot of stuff. Our names may be called in a little while, and there will be none to answer. Let that life be hidden, God, and that name be registered in heaven, and it is immortalized. Follow on wherever Christ leads. Let the footprints which you leave behind you on the sands of time be such that others may safely follow in the pathway of holiness. It's my prayer that as Jesus' coming becomes more imminent, and I don't know how that's possible. Brothers and sisters, we're living in the end of time. We're living in the end of time. Do your neighbors know that you love Jesus and he loves you? If not, why not? I think I told you about a dream I had about a guy named Mike who delivered my milk to my home when Audrey and I were first married. And in that dream, now I saw Mike four times a week. And in that dream, he said to me, you knew this and didn't tell me. And I'm on the outside looking in to God's kingdom because you had the opportunity and didn't share? Look back through your past. Look at the people that you have come in contact with. Some of them may have even asked for a witness of what makes you different and what God has done for you. Jesus came just for you. What have you done for him? Number 289 is our closing song. And it's entitled, The Savior is Waiting. 